I hope you guys are having a good day. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, the Black Business School. And I want to say hello. Welcome to the Black Financial Channel, the blackfinancialchannel.com. The blackfinancialchannel.com is the place where we talk about black financial issues and we do it on a daily basis and break it down in a way that is both intelligent and black. Uh, so as you come into the conversation, I hope you guys would take a second and hit the thumbs up button. Uh, make sure you do that. Hit the thumbs up button, share and subscribe button, because there is a lot to talk about today. And uh, also, we want to just make you smarter. So I want to say hello also to my friends at the African History Network uh, run by the, the, the awesome Michael Emotep. How you doing today? Good. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, so let me um, let me kind of tell you guys what I've been uh, sort of looking into uh, today. Um, I got, uh, I, I've sort of, I don't know if you guys, give me a yes or no if you've been following uh, a lot of the craziness with uh, the movie Harriet. Uh, there's been a lot of mixed reviews, a lot of conversations about the movie Harriet in terms of, um, you know, whether or not it represents uh, historical accuracies or inaccuracies, uh, whether or not it's a movie that black people should see, uh, whether or not they just kind of totally made some shit up and just threw it up on screen and basically, you know, profited from, uh, from black suffering. There was a sister, uh, I shared her video on my Instagram, uh, which is it's a really good video. Uh, my Instagram is The Real Voice Watkins. And I shared the sister's video. I don't have her name in front of me, but you should go watch this video on The Real Voice Watkins on Instagram. And she basically talks about uh, something that I thought was a, a very appropriately uh, termed way to describe something that, that has always bothered me, uh, which is uh, the monetization of black suffering. The monetization of black suffering. And uh, she basically said, you know, th that there were so many characters in this film that were just made up. You know, there apparently there's a I haven't seen the film yet. Um, I'm probably going to see it today uh, with Alicia, mainly so that you don't have to see it if you don't want to. Right. So I'm going to go see it tonight. So you don't have to see it if you don't want to. Uh, I feel like as an obligation to, you know, my supporters and the people that listen to what I have to say, I should see it so I can give you an honest assessment of it. Uh, my goal is not to drown the movie. Uh, I met Lene. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, what's not Laneja? Laneja Betts, my friend. Um, Janelle Monet. I met her uh, on the Breakfast Club, actually, uh, not about maybe a year or two ago, and she was. A, she seemed like a nice enough lady. We didn't talk much, but you know, I want to try to be fair to the film. Uh, but I think that there's some reasons to be really concerned here. Uh, when you're just making things up, like literally just making, like like literally going back in history and grabbing like facts out of your ass that's a problem like 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 you know you can take some creative license right you know some freedoms to kind of embellish things look because you got to make it cool right you got to make it interesting okay i get that but you go and you create a black bounty hunter mind you there were black bounty hunters but they were not nearly as common as, hmm, I don't know, let's think, hmm, maybe white bounty hunters? Maybe maybe it was the white people who had the bigger incentive to go out and, and hunt down slaves. I, I don't know. Man, I, yeah, I ain't a history major, but I got to ask my friend Anthony Browder. Maybe he can fill me in on this. But, but, but you go and you create a black bounty hunter, which adds to the consistent Hollywood agenda of, of, of making the black man appear to either being violent or if he's not violent, he's going to be feminine, right? Y'all know how it is. Y'all know the agenda, right? And because we're just all just big bundles of toxic masculinity, apparently, according to Hollywood. And, and, and then you create these other characters that did not exist. I think that's a problem. That's an issue. That's an issue because there are people who are saying, well, you know, I, I think Black Enterprise, and I respect the people over Black Enterprise, but there was some a writer at Black Enterprise who said, you know, if you don't go see Harriet, then don't complain when our stories aren't being told. Well, first of all, that's a marketing tactic, right? Like, because we know black people are the economic fuel behind a lot of success that happens in this country. Now, I'm not trying to say that black people shouldn't support businesses that we believe in. I just think we should support black businesses first. That's, that's the first thing. But then the second thing is you're not really telling our story. You're not really telling our story. You're telling a story, right? Let's just, just be clear. You're telling a story, and it's loosely based on the life of Harry Tubman. Now, with that said, I want to ask you guys a question. I want, I want you guys to give me a yes or no to this question. Uh, actually, please hit the thumbs up button if you haven't done this yet. If you're on Facebook, please share this to your page. I want to ask you guys a yes or no question. Yes or no, yes or no. Give me a yes or no. Are you going to go see the movie Harriet? I want to ask you guys this. That's the first question I want to ask you. Do you plan to see the movie Harriet uh, to make an assessment, or do you plan to walk away? Give me a yes or no. Uh, yes, I plan to see it. 
No, I plan to not see it. I'm, I'm really curious to get the pulse on the, on the people. All right, so I see T Mac, uh, Chili Willy from Philly says no. Twan says no. Uh, <clears throat> let me see. I saw a yes from Felicia Johnson. Uh, Shyla, no. Angel, yes. C Well says saw it yesterday. Dynasty, yes. Max says hell no. Kevin Lockhart, yes. NG says no. Vanessa Jones, no, no, no. Slim D says it's rated PG 13, though. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of seeing a lot of a lot more no's than yeses. That's, that's the first thing that's really interesting. I see a lot of no's. Um, that doesn't mean the movie's not going to succeed, but it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, the other question I want to ask is, you know, are you do you feel offended by what you're hearing about the film? Uh, yes or no? Do you feel offended that they modified history in some, you know, relevant way to tell the story they want to tell? Like, do you feel offended by it to the point where you almost feel at least I, I, I can say I do a little bit. I feel a little offended by the fact that Hollywood, uh, first of all, they wouldn't tell our stories. Then when they start telling our stories, they tell them inaccurately. And then when they tell them inaccurately, the, the inaccuracy and the bias just happens to be, uh, you know, a bias that is against the black male as if we need another thing to marginalize us, as, as if we need another factor to make us appear to be something that we're not. You know, um, who was it? Byron Allen said this on The Breakfast Club the other day, and I'm actually going to talk about Byron Allen in a minute because I did not know that there's an interesting and surprising link between Byron Allen and his Comcast lawsuit and the movie Harriet. There's a reason why. They, I, I, now, I, now the pieces are coming together. I understand now why Byron went on to The Breakfast Club to talk about his lawsuit this week. When the lawsuit's been going on for four years, by the way, the lawsuit's been going on for years, right? So he went out this week to talk about it. And I believe he was trying to murder that movie. He was trying to take that movie out. And I can't halfway blame him, y'all. I, I just can't blame him because when I'm connecting the dots, it's starting to become a little bit of a problem. Now, before we move on, do me a quick favor. If you're watching on the Black Financial Channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Some of you are not subscribed. I invited you and I sent some of you a text message. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell really quick uh, and hit the thumbs up button, right? So if you haven't, hit those three bells. Please do that right now. Uh, on the count of three, everybody, please do that. Uh, on the count of three, hit the um, the thumbs up button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell. The Black Financial Channel is your financial channel. It's a financial channel to cover financial news on a daily basis from a black perspective. You guys know my PhD is in finance, and I love talking to the people about what's going on in stock markets, what's going on in the world of business, all that. So on the count of three, everybody hit those three buttons. On the count of three, one, two, three. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, type black power in the chat to let me know that you did it. Type black power in the chat. That's what we call our black power exercise because we're trying to deliberately grow black owned media. That's our goal. Like, so Byron Allen, I hope he wins his lawsuit. I hope he gets on Comcast. Comcast ain't gonna make no deals with Boyce Watkins, and that's okay. I'm all right with that. I don't really don't know about really, I don't have as much of a stomach to work in that space as he does. Uh, but I bl God bless the brother. I wish him the very best. I have nothing against him. We all have different strategies. So this is our version of black owned media. So I hope you guys will participate and see yourselves as an important part of that process. Michael Emotep's African History Network, which has over 1.1 million followers, is also part of black media. Right. So when we're gathering hundreds of thousands of people at a time, millions of people at a time, that's what a TV network does. A TV network just gets, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of viewers. And then next thing you know, you can get your message out. So that's what we're doing. We're building here. So please hit the thumbs up button um, and all that stuff. All right. So the, the next question I'm going to ask you is this. This relates to the Comcast lawsuit. Now, the Comcast lawsuit that Byron Allen filed, let me read some of this to you. I'm going to read some of the background on the lawsuit. Now, just in case you don't know, in the Black Business School, which is uh, the premier educational institution for black people built by black people, we're not an HBCU because we're not owned by the government. We, cr we created this out of the black community. Next week, I'm going to do a very special lecture for all the students in the Black Business School. It's totally free, does not cost you a penny. It's going to be a lecture where I'm going to take Byron Allen's Breakfast Club interview and break it down, chop it into little pieces, and we're gonna look at it with the microscope and we're gonna analyze every piece so you can talk about how you can implement some of Alan's philosophies into your home, but also how you can so you can understand some of the politics behind wealth in America, okay? So if you wanna join, but you gotta be a member of the Black Business School, but you can join for free, go to theblackbusinessschool.com, T-H-E, that's theblackbusinessschool.com. Byron Allen is a, uh, is, a, is a great guy and I wanna really break down some of his stuff. In fact, I actually got another phone call just now from another billionaire you guys should know about by the name of Mike Roberts. I can show you on my phone, I don't, I'm, this is my phone so I can't show you, but actually Mike called me five minutes ago 
And I'm going to have Michael back on the Black Financial Channel very soon. Michael Roberts, look him up. He's a black billionaire. He and his brother have built a billion dollar empire you know, around the world. So these are the people that you really need to know about. You know about all the rappers. You know about all the entertainers that can't spell they, they own mama's name. You need to know about your billionaires, too. You need to learn about your scholars also. You need to learn about all of that because those are the people that are going to give you the freedom that you deserve. All right. So let me keep let me read some of this. This is from Hollywood Reporter. This is a breakdown of the Byron Allen uh, lawsuit. It says, while the TV mogul alleges racism and Comcast refusal to license his niche channels, U.S. businesses worry that a win for Allen during the new high court term would increase legal costs and hurt their reputation. So they're worried about being put on blast, basically. It says, when Byron Allen first launched a legal rampage back in 2015, few would have guessed he would get to the Supreme Court with a case that could transform the way discrimination lawsuits are handled and represents a, co a coda on 19th century reconstruction efforts after the Civil War. Once known as the entrepreneur who debuted as a stand-up comedian on The Tonight Show as a teenager, Allen, 58, sued cable operators and satellite distributors after they refused to license his small channels devoted to topics including criminal justice, cars, and pets. He hired an attorney who defended the city of Los Angeles in the Rodney King beating case and demanded tens of billions of dollars via allegations of a racial bias against Comcast, DirecTV, Charter, and others. Now, Al Sharpton is actually mentioned in this case, which is really interesting. It, so here's what's crazy about his suit. This is what makes his suit very interesting. Just how out there was Allen's lawsuit, the NCAA, sorry, not NCAA, the NAACP, not the NCAA. Damn, I just sound like a white man right there. Uh, the NAACP and Al Sharpton were originally co-defendants in the case for allegedly taking actions to whitewash Comcast's discriminatory business practices. As the story was told in the suit, when Comcast sought regulatory approval for its 2010 bid to acquire NBC Universal, it looked to gather support. Y'all know how it is. Y'all, y'all know what they do, right? You know what it is. If you want to be racist, all you gotta do here's a tra here's a here's a uh, training on how to be a racist white man. Here's here's a, a training. If, if you want to be a racist white man and you want to get away with it, you go find the Negro managers. You find the the so-called leaders. They call them leaders, but they're not leaders. They're managers. Leaders are supposed to inspire you to be great and to you know pursue your passion and follow your bliss and to, and to achieve great things. Managers are just there to control you, right? So y'all know the difference. Do we get it? Yes or no? Do you get what I'm saying? The difference between a Negro leader and a, and, and a excuse me, a black leader and a Negro manager, right? So you go get the Negro managers and you get them on your side. And the way you can get them on your side is you can do one of two things. You can either send $20 or a bucket of chicken. One of the two, uh, $20 or a bucket of chicken, throw in a Popeye's chicken sandwich and some um, maybe some uh, Air Jordans and or something like that. And, and they're good, right? So, so here's what uh, Alan basically says in the lawsuit. He says that uh, to calm any fears that the merger would have a detrimental impact on diversity, Comcast made voluntary commitments and came to memoranda of understanding with various civil rights groups like the NAACP, National Urban League, and Sharpton's National Action Network. But Allen took issue with those so-called sham agreements, questioning the monetary donations that Comcast had made to these groups, and further challenging how Comcast was spending $25 billion annually on channel licensing, but less than $3 million on what he characterized as 100% African-American-owned media. Now, let's let's process this for a moment, shall we? Let's stop for a minute. We got to meditate. Let's do a Wusa moment so we can really internalize what, what was said right here in this statement. Do you ever go to, like, have you ever been to a, um, like a, a Negro manager convention, like an NAACP? No disrespect to NAACP. They do some good work. I'm not going to say that all the work is bad, but they need, we need something better. Let's, I, yes or no? Give, give me a yes or no. Do you think that we need something better than the NAACP? Or national actual. Do, do we need something better? Give me a yes or no so we can at least try to be on the same page. I'm not saying that they haven't done anything. I'm not trying to say that they don't do good work sometimes. I just really think maybe we need something better. Do you get can you can we agree on that? Give me a yes or no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Kalia, uh, Kalila, and thank you, Jennifer Jackson and Malvo 12 and D Love and everybody else. Uh, and those of you on the African History Network, for some reason, my phone is not showing me your comments, so I can't see your comments. But you know, guys, you guys know I love you, and I, I'm, 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 I'm with you spiritually, and, and, and so I can't see you, but, but I'm with you. Okay, so, so here's the thing, right? If you've been to one of these uh, conventions, Congressional Black Caucus, NAACP, Urban League, National National Network, you ever notice how most of these events have corporate sponsors along the wall? Everything sponsored, right? It's like you know. The revolution will be televised, brought to you by McDonald's, right? Um, you know, 
let's educate our children bought to you by Walmart. Uh, you know, we're going to have the Wells Fargo Gala tonight at eight o'clock, you know, at the such and such, right? The, um, you know, the, the, the Target JCPenney Awards are, are going to be happening tonight, right? It's, it's, they're, they're just experts at obtaining corporate sponsorship. And, and I think that that's fine. You know, white companies get sponsorship. I'm not dissing that part. The problem, though, is that many of these sponsorships are basically get out of jail free cards for companies that are doing some really horrible racist shit. They're basically get out of jail free cards for companies that are like, OK, we stole 10 billion dollars from black people last year, but we're going to give back a million dollars to your organization so that you will allow us to steal from you. These are what, what you might call R. Kelly agreements. These are R. Kelly agreements. And let me explain what I mean when I say these are R. Kelly agreements. Tell me this. Y'all now, now, remember how the R. Kelly thing went down? Nobody, you know, I, I don't think anybody in their right mind can support, you know, the idea of any man, black, white, or otherwise, you know, messing with little girls, right? I, I'm not a fan of R. Kelly. Y'all know that. But the reason I call these R. Kelly agreements is because y'all know, I, I'm in Chicago and I know this. You can't tell me that there wasn't some parents out there that basically sold their kids to that man. Like, you can't tell me that there were some parents that were just like, look, you take care of us. You make sure the bills are paid. My da our daughter's a hoe anyway, so she might as well be a hoe with a celebrity, right? Like, you can't tell me that there were some parents who basically said, look, you just pay the rent, pay the, you know, make sure we good financially and everything straight. Now, when we're not good, when the money stops coming, when the checks stop flowing, then suddenly we're going to convert ourselves into victims of, of your treachery and we're going to go public, right? That's how the game works, right? So a lot of the people that you saw in that Dream Hampton documentary, Lord knows, I mean, I know I know a little bit about Dream Hampton. I would love for them to do a documentary about her life, her personal life, her garbage, her baggage. It's interesting, but here's the thing, right? Many of the people in the documentary that were victims were people where you, where people could not understand. Like, how did how did R. Kelly get a hold of your 17-year-old daughter in, in, in 2015? Now, I understand this happened in 1994, before you knew what he was. But by 2015, everybody knew who R. Kelly was. Everybody knew what R. Kelly was into, right? So, But what you're seeing, the reason you're confused by that, is that what you're seeing is the result of a deal gone bad, a business deal gone bad, a bad deal gone bad, right? Two criminals made an agreement, and one criminal did not uphold his obligation to the other criminal. So that other criminal comes out and says, I'm a victim. Let me tell you how terrible this person is. Well, really, y'all both a couple scumbags as far as I'm concerned, because I don't know. Anybody got kids in here? Anybody got kids in here? How many of you, yes or no, give me a yes or no. How many of you would let your 16-year-old daughter date R. Kelly? How many of you would be okay with that, with R, with your daughter, if, if she could sing, be in the studio with R. Kelly? Yes or no? Who would do that? Anybody, any any terrible parents in the room who would let their child go hang out with R. Kelly in the year 2015 or, or 2012? I mean, seriously, no, there's no parent on, there, on, on earth that would be that stupid. So my question is, why would you, did you do it? You're either really, like, literally the dumbest human being on the planet, or you was on some shady shit. Now, why do I call these R. Kelly agreements? Well, because those are the types of agreements that these organizations make with companies that engage in wrongdoing against African-Americans. They pretty much have situations where they are able to do these shakedowns, where as soon as the company gets accused of discrimination and somebody's ready to file a, a billion dollar lawsuit, somebody's ready to go to the cops, somebody's ready to put their ass on blast, or they're ready to pay you up millions of dollars in, 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 in what they've stolen from these employees or for redlining or, or you know, firing people for no reason or whatever. And they go to these organizations and they pay these organizations for protection. And the organizations sometimes, unfortunately, they inadvertently participate in this process. They come to the companies and say, look, you've got a Negro problem. And I am your Negro solution. I am your Negro manager who can calm down the masses if you make sure that my organization gets well funded. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold a march and a rally. You know, Sharpton's good at that, right? Anybody ever notice how Sharpton holds a lot of marches and rallies and gets it gets lets you get all the energy out and let you yell and scream and complain. And then after it's over, like nothing happens. Like it goes away. Like, like there's no follow up. There's no there's, there's there's nothing. I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to get, just go after the man and like that. You know, it's it's over. I mean, I'm not really into uh, going after other black people like that. I'm not going to spend much time on that. But has anybody ever noticed how there's really very little follow up? Well, a lot of times it's because uh, of basically the um, 
the politics of redirection. Just I'm going to take all this ball of energy that's targeted at you. We're going to redirect it in another direction. And then we're going to let it dissipate out into the air. So it's like it's like a, almost like a nuclear bomb. Like you got a bomb aimed for a city. Think about superhero movies when they shoot a missile. Anybody ever seen a Superman movie and the, the bad guy shoots a super missile or a, a, a nuclear weapon across the sea and it's going to hit New York City? What does Superman do? He grab he flies up, he grabs the missile and he takes it into the ocean and then it blows up and then nobody gets hurt. Right. You disparage the or you, you, you dissipate the energy so that it doesn't hit the target. Right. So effectively, these R. Kelly agreements that are made with these organizations end up costing you billions and billions of dollars. And so what Byron Allen is doing is he's stepping beyond and above that and saying, no, you're not going to buy my loyalty with a bucket of chicken. You're not going to write a little check for five hundred thousand dollars. I spend that much money on toilet paper. That's what Byron Allen says. He's like, I'm a billionaire. I play big boy games. I'm not some little you know, greasy headed pastor who wants to get an extra hundred thousand dollars for the building fund. I'm a guy that wants to do business like the white boys and get money like the white boys. And you're not going to treat me like a child. So he didn't just sue Comcast and Universal. He sued. Uh, let me make sure I can double check. If I'm not mistaken, he sued um, the National Action Network the NAACP, the Urban League. He, I, 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 a lot of these organizations were, I think he went after the Obama administration. He was going after Obama back when most Negroes was licking Obama's feet, licking the bottoms of his toes, right? And, and so that that's a very bold thing to do. I have to give him credit for being a bold man. Now, let me keep, I'm gonna keep going. Do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button, please, real quick. If you haven't hit the thumbs up button, hit the thumbs up button, share and subscribe button. Make sure you subscribe to theblackfinancialchannel.com, theblackfinancialchannel.com. That's our financial, uh, our daily financial news channel. You guys know I have a PhD in finance. I love breaking down issues and I love sharing things with you that'll make your life better. So I'm not just here to be a guy running his mouth on the internet so I can be cool. I'm here to actually make sure that you and your family are better off. That's what we do. So theblackfinancialchannel.com. And also, if you happen to live in Chicago, we're holding an all black excellence page tournament on November 9th. If you want to come out, you live in the Chicago land area, anywhere nearby, come on out. If you want to play spades, it's so much fun. And we just want to get together and have some fun as black people. So, and it don't cost that much. We got to have a little entry fee to pay for the building, but that's it. $20, something like that. So go to drboycechicago.com. That's drboycechicago.com. And I'll put other events at Dr. Boyce Chicago as well. I like, I want to do more stuff in the Chicago area. All right. So let me read more of this to you. So, Allen took issue with these so-called sham agreements, questioning the monetary donations that Comcast had made to these groups and further challenging how Comcast was spending $25 billion a year on channel licensing, but less than $3 million on African-American owned media. On the day the suit was filed, Sharpton called me, he called the Hollywood Reporter guy, and strenuously took issue with the claim that his reported $750,000 salary for hosting an MSNBC show was essentially a disguised payment for having supported Comcast's acquisition of NBC Universal. Sharpton promised he'd retaliate against Allen with a defamation suit, but the suit never happened. Never followed through. Never got around to that, huh? Um, now, here's what um, I want to ask you guys. Give me a yes or no. I, I don't know if, it, if you've seen Al Sharpton on TV as a, as a newscaster, I want to ask you this question. This is a leading, loaded question I'm about to ask you. Do you think that Al Sharpton is one of the best news reporters and television commentators, you know, in America? Like, do you feel like Al just really stood out as a comic? Like he was so good, just 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 right on point and 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 just, you know, like like he's just he just it just articulates every word perfectly and just knows his shit and is, is just built for this. Like, do you feel like Al was just born to be a journalist? Or or mm, do you or do you maybe feel like maybe there could have been there are other black journalists who could have done the job a little bit better? Like did, you think that he was the best guy that they could have found to host the show for journalists when you got thousands of hungry black journalists out here that, with, that dedicate every every hour of their lives to being the best journalists they could possibly be who are part of the National Black Journalist Association. Do you remember when the Black Journalist Association protested the hiring of Sharpton to basically say we've got journalists out here that have spent 30 years in the field? who can't get a, a whiff from MSNBC, but you go around all of that so you can pick the Negro manager to take the job. 
I mean, I'm just being, I'm keeping it 100 with y'all. I'm not trying to, this ain't really attacking nobody. I'm not attacking Sharpton. I, I actually, I know, just to let you, to, 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 to prove to you I'm not attacking him, I will give him a compliment. He's actually, I sat next to this man very close on multiple occasions. He is one of the smartest people I have ever met. I, when I talk to people, I can measure how quickly they can answer questions, how they retain information, all of that. And because I'm a deep person, it's, you can't you can't really pull too many too much wool over my eyes. Sharpton is very smart, so don't ever think he's just some dumb bootleg preacher. He ain't no dummy. He's very sharp, very sophisticated, very savvy. So I say that all to just basically say, and that's maybe that's why he and Obama got along because both of those are smart guys. But just because they smart don't mean they always your friends. Or better yet. I need you to be just as smart as they are so that when they're doing something for themselves, that they're also doing something for you. All right. So so here's more of, of, of what's what's going on with the lawsuit. So Byron Allen, um, let's see here. A lot has changed in the four years since the suit was filed. For starters, Allen has proved himself to be one of the most ambitious moguls in entertainment. In 2018, he spent three hundred million to buy the Weather Channel. Then he teamed up with the Sinclair Broadcast Group to buy Fox Sports assets that were divested as part of the Disney merger. And on October 1st, he unveiled a $290 million deal to acquire 11 local TV stations uh, affiliated with CBS, NBC, and ABC. Uh, now his suit is going to be heard by the Supreme Court uh, it, during the term that began Monday. Allen's suit was rejected three times by a district court judge who saw no plausible case that discrimination caused Comcast not to license Allen's channels. In reviving the case and giving Allen the green light, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals concluded that Allen needed only to plausibly allege that discriminatory intent was a factor, but the but not the but for cause of Comcast's refusal to license his channels. So basically, what they're saying is what the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals did for for Allen, which was a win for him, was they said, look, you just only have to prove that discrimination was a factor, not the factor, not the only factor. Right. You just have to prove that it was a part of the reason that they discriminated against you. Now, what the, now the problem is, though, that a more conservative court, which our Supreme Court is, might rule that you have to prove that discrimination is the only factor. That literally there's nothing else that could have played a part in any of this, like like almost oh, a little bit like the court of law where you have to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, which pretty much means like 95 to 96, 97 percent of of your doubt has to be erased in order for you to move forward with the conviction. So in order to convict a company of discrimination, you need to have this overwhelming amount of evidence that being black was the only reason they discriminated against you, which is a really tough standard to meet because think about this. You know, I don't know how many of y'all in this room are perfect. Uh, if you are, then congratulations because you, you're probably a lying ass son of a bitch because you ain't perfect, right? Uh, so, so tell me, it, you know, in any job, think about this. You know, they can find any reason to fire you. I mean, if they if they look for any time you made a mistake, any blemish on your record, anywhere you were not perfect, they can always find a reason to fire you. Right. So, in fact, let me ask you guys a yes or no question. Give me a yes or no. This is this is what I think connects the case to you in terms of understanding the relevance of what's going on. And this is why I support what Byron Allen is doing. This is why I support his lawsuit. Yes or no. How many of you have experienced some sort of racism on the job? Give me a yes if you have, a no if you have not. Have you ever experienced racism on the job? I'm going to just sit back and sip my coffee while I watch all the yeses pour in, uh, you know, like that people in the candy store. Let me see here. Okay, let me see. What, what we got? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Lynn and Jennifer and Creamy Bread and Anita Watkins. Mm -hmm. Yep. Look at that. Wow. Look, look at that. Wow. All these yeses. You see, see, I'm, I'm. I, I'm a, I was I was a little bit misleading just now. I asked that question already knowing what the answer is. I, I I threw the I threw the ball 80 yards down the field and I ran and I caught the ball because I knew exactly where the ball was going to land. Because here's the deal. Here's what's happening in America, and this is why in the Black Business School, for example, we're such advocates of Black people building their own. And this is where Alan and I part a little bit. You know, Alan is fighting for a way in, right? He's fighting for a way into the white economic system. And I support that. I really do. Uh, you know, because I, I think, you know, Alan is a boss. I think Alan is doing what he wants to do. Um, you know, but we're not the same. You know, so for example, I saw his wife. I was like, ah, I don't know if I would have married that woman. I don't think I would have done that. Y'all Hollywood Negroes. I don't know why y'all like these white women so much, but, but it didn't make me dislike him. I respect what he's doing, but we're not the same. So let's just be clear. But I but that doesn't mean we can't support each other. That doesn't mean we can't, you know, say, let's let's find our common ground 
as opposed to the things that divide us. So I'm not going to beat up on them for that. But y'all know how much I love my black woman and how much I think black love is an important part of black wealth and black community and black building and black everything. That's why I'm getting married July 11th, 2020. Everybody's invited. Everybody watching, all of you, if you want to come to the wedding, you're all invited because I want to celebrate black love. I think it's that important for us as a community to love each other. But but beyond that, though, I support the suit because he's addressing something that we all go through. We've all gone through it. You know, <clears throat> racial discrimination is one of those things, one of those few types of discrimination out here where you can't win shit on racial discrimination cases in America. You can't. You know, you if you're gay, you can win a lawsuit against that. If you, you know, if you're a woman, white women, shit, white women win big time from uh, d- these diversity clauses and all this other stuff. They, they, they win, they, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the greatest benefits of, of most of the civil rights that were designed for black people. And, uh, but, but if you're black, you know, most people who go through some sort of racial discrimination on the job do not receive justice. Most black people, y'all know why the hell Byron Allen wasn't included in the damn deal with Comcast and Universal? For the same reason they don't include no black people in the damn deal. Right, they no black people were invited to the fucking table. Excuse my French, I don't mean to cuss. I'm sorry, I promise us I wouldn't cuss today. No black people were invited to the table because that's how they always do business. That's, that's what they always do in these deals. And, and and unfortunately, the Negro managers, you know, the so-called civil rights leaders, don't make it any easier because they basically show up and they take their little bucket of chicken, their little Popeye's chicken sandwich, and twenty dollars, and they say, okay, we'll control the masses in exchange. For whatever little whatever little rewards you're giving us. So what I'm trying to tell you is that it's not so much that you got to get rid of you know the pastors and the and the civil rights leaders and people like that. Maybe they can do good work, but at the end of the day, when they're doing work, they need to be doing work for you, like real work for you. And that doesn't always come to the forefront. That isn't always what you see. You don't always feel like they're really working for you. You always feel like they're working for the agenda. Or they're working for, or they're working for the for the white folks. You don't feel like they're working for you because if they were really working for you, then then some some of these battles they would stand up and fight and say, no, we cannot be bought. We're not interested in taking any money for this. Or we'll, we'll take money when you make sure you do justice for everybody. So so you think about it. You remember when Malcolm X used to say, you can't really pay me off because if you take care of me and you're not taking care of my people, then. We can't we can't make a deal if you are accepting me and not accepting all of us. Right. The difference between the Negro managers and I think true black leaders is whether or not you're trying to bring the masses with you in your prosperity. It's OK for a pastor to have money. It's OK for a civil rights leader to live in a mansion. I don't get mad about those things. People get mad. like, Oh, that Negro driving a fancy car. He got a big house. Look, he all happy and shit. Why he happy? Why he ain't broke like me? He supposed to be broke because niggas is supposed to be broke, right? You got people with that mindset. Like they want to see black people suffer. If you're not suffering like them, then they're going to hate you just because they hate themselves and they hate their lives. And that's kind of what they do. I don't want to be in that category. I don't want to be mad when another black person does well. But I think the question becomes at the end of the day, how are you bringing the, a chunk of the community with you? Are you representing just you or are you representing Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who will receive direct and immediate significant benefits from the prosperity that you claim for yourself. And that's that's a tough call. That's a tough thing. So so with this particular case, um, you know, colorofchange.org, I just got an email from them uh, stating that they didn't even get to the Harriet movie yet. But the Harriet movie. uh, uh, Let me ask you guys this. Are are you I think I asked you guys earlier. Are you planning to go see the Harriet movie or not? I'm going to go see it so you don't have to go see it. And I'll come back and I'll do a review. I decided during this conversation, I'm going to go see it. Uh, and the reason the Harriet movie movie is connected to the Byron Allen case is because Comcast is the parent company of the company that is making the Harriet movie. I'm, I'm going to try to see if I can find the email. Hit the thumbs up button while I find this email. I'm going to see if I can read some of this to you. Um, and, uh, and I'll read you exactly what Color of Change wrote. And I actually I love if you are from Color of Change, just know that I appreciate your work. I think it's very, very good. And uh, and they 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 are just they're, I mean, they're a powerhouse. They're an excellent activist group. Uh, let me see if I can find. Let's see. I got the email in my box. Let me see. If I can find it. I can't find it real quick. I'm going to just bounce on out. But let me see here. Color of Change. Please hit the thumbs up button while while we wait while, while I find this. Um, you know what? I don't see it in here. But I did actually, um, I printed out a screenshot, but I don't have it with me. 
So anyway, colorofchange.org is basically protesting um, the the Harriet movie because the company that made the Harriet movie, whatever the production company is called, uh, here we go, I just found it. Um, so the uh, here's what they wrote. Com Comcast and its executives are seeking to roll back landmark civil rights protections for black people while also seeking to profit from our pain and the history of our struggle. Just two weeks before its Supreme Court challenge to our oldest civil rights law, Comcast, the parent company of film production company Focus Features, is releasing autobiograph autobiographical film Harriet, based on the former, formerly enslaved and abolitionist hero Harriet Tubman. Tubman risked her life countless times to free hundreds of enslaved people and lived to see the nation's first civil rights law come to pass, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The same Civil Rights Act that Comcast is currently petitioning the Supreme Court to strike down. We cannot allow a corporation to set a dangerous precedent with our rights while also profiting from the painful past that led to the passing of the very Civil Rights Act it is challenging. So basically what they're saying is that Comcast is seeking to make money from a black story, another another slave story. I don't know how y'all feel about slave movies, but they kind of get on my nerves. It, it kinda, isn't, it, isn't it kind of funny that they, they love telling you about times when you were miserable or when you were violent or when you were, you know, being getting your ass kicked. They don't like telling you about what happened before slavery actually took place. Like they seem to they, they seem to remember the last 300, 400 years of history, but they seem to have forgotten the previous 30,000 years when we were running shit, when the Europeans were coming to Africans to get knowledge on mathematics and uh, astronomy and medicine and everything else, right? They they seem to not remember that part, but they 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 just seem to really obsess over the you know over everything that's happened in the last three or four hundred years, you know. And so and so every few months is another damn slave movie. The help you got all these driving Miss Daisy type movies coming out, and 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 it's 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 to the point where you know I know that there are some Negroes out there that so, you know that are very happy that that white people decided to tell our story. But what I encourage you to consider this is this. You got black filmmakers that can tell a black story. You got great black filmmakers out here. You got people like Mark Harris, great filmmaker. Anybody ever seen a Mark Harris movie? This man is extraordinary. You got brothers. Uh, what, what, what's uh, Rick Mathis? You made Black Friday. You got Tariq Nasheed, made Hidden Colors in, in, in 1804. You got Dorian Chandler out of New York, who made Resurrecting Black Wall Street. You got all. You got Peter Parker out here. You know who made Black Capital, which is one of the films that we released under Boyce Watkins Films. You got great black filmmakers in your own community. And so I'm almost inclined to say just on GP alone, um, maybe that $10, 20 $30 you're going to spend. Because, you know, you go to the movies, you're going to buy your ticket, a ticket for your woman, ticket for the kids. And you're going to have to go buy that damn $5 popcorn. So by the time the day's done, you're going to drop $50, $60, $70, right? That's what y'all going to do. When Black Panther comes out, they're going to make a billion dollars from the black community in about a week, right? It'll take about a week to get a billion dollars out of the black community, right? Um. I would say, you know, be equally diligent in supporting things that come out of your own community because you got some really good films coming out of the black community. In fact, I was just actually invited to distribute one of our films on Quayle TV. K W E L I TV. Anybody ever heard of Quayle TV? Uh, I, I've heard of them. I've seen them around. Um, I, of course, I want to subscribe. If I haven't subscribed, I probably have a subscription because I get subscriptions to black shit just to just to support. And I mean, I watch it ever, but. Um, but you may want to check that out. Uh, we're going to put our films on there, and there are other uh, filmmakers I, that are going to put stuff out there. And there's another really good film, and I can't, I don't have the brother's name. Marcus Small, Marcus Small, director Marcus Small made a great film called The Melanin Code. If you have not seen The Melanin Code, you should check that out. That's kind of in that hidden colors genre. It's it's a really damn good movie. And so my point is to say, give me a yes or no if you get what I'm saying on this. Well, yes or no, what, what do you think? Do we need white people to tell our story? Yes or no? Do we do? I mean, do white people have to be the ones to tell black stories? Like, do you know? Do we need that? Give me a yes or no. Let's. I I I know it's a simple question, but I need y'all to confirm this with me that you get what I'm saying. You don't need other people to tell your story. You know, look, dear black people, you are no longer disabled. You can stand up from the fucking wheelchair. Right. You, you, you know, your, your legs are working now, but you're still rolling around. You still got Negroes rolling around the wheelchair because in their mind, they can't walk. 
right? And what I'm saying is, just stand up. Just stand up. You ain't got to, you, you know, some, you know what I'm talking about? You know, you got niggas like, we can't do nothing. We need y'all to help us. Black lives matter. I need your job. Can you hire us? Y'all won't give us no opportunities. I'm, you know, and I want to just say to some of those people, like, look, I want to tap you like a, like a fairy godfather and tap you on the shoulder and say, you got power. Well, let's activate your personal power. Let's activate what's inside of you. You know, your reparations, they're inside of you. Your prosperity, that's inside of you. Your success, that's inside of you. Anything you want to build in your community, that's inside of you. You got the expertise. You got the experience. You built You built America, by the way. You built America. Many of y'all are still building America. You're working for other people, but you're building America. Uh, you, you've got a ton of wealth, all the wealth you need to really build uh, pretty much anything in your community. You got $1.3 trillion. Remember, you got $1.3 trillion. You can do a lot with $1.3 trillion. Just be clear about that. So, so my point is to say... It's not so much. I mean, we could go down the list of the reasons why you shouldn't support the Harriet story. Right. I mean, you know, making things up like this black bounty hunter that came from outer space. Like, is, was he is he from Krypton? Is that what happened? Is he is he like the same villain that tried to attack Superman? Is that is that what y'all doing? Are y'all really turning Harriet Tubman's story into like a Marvel comic book? Like, is that what the fuck it is now? Like, no, this is a real black woman who had a real story. And the real villain, the reason they won't give you all the real villains, because they know who the fuck the real villain is. Excuse my French. I, I'm, I, I know y'all. I know some of y'all are okay with my cussing. I, I, I'm trying not to cuss as much. But so y'all, they know who the villain is, and they don't want to tell you who the villain was. They don't want to tell themselves who the villain was, because it's hard to look at yourself and say, I was the bad guy. It's very hard to do that, right? So these you know, these 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 scary black men that from outer space that they have chasing Harriet Tubman, you know, shooting at her with laser beams and flying off on, on purple dragons. No, no, no. Harriet Tubman, y'all know who the hell she was fighting against. And so my point is to say that you could talk about all the reasons why the Tubman movie is problematic, all the reasons why Hollywood didn't get it right. But what you must do is go deeper and realize they don't never get it right when it comes to telling your story because they shouldn't be telling your damn story. That's like giving some. That's like when we send our kids to white people to educate them in public schools, and then we're like, they ain't educating our kids right. They ain't doing our kids right. They abusing our kids. They mistreating our kids. Well, then somebody with some common sense, like my friends in the Hebrew Israelites and the Nation of Islam, might come along and say, well, you know, they're not supposed to be educating your kids. You do know that, right? They shouldn't even have your children. Right. That's why that's why I love. That's why if you if you Hebrew Israelite or if you are NOI, uh, you know, and, and everybody else who thinks or just free thinking black people like shout yourselves out because I love you because people like you are the ones that, that I talk to first because you kind of get it. You get it at a fundamental level. And that's why I love the way you think. It's like, well, well, who should be maybe instead of being mad about the fact that you're doing the job wrong, maybe I should just realize that you shouldn't be doing the job. So here's the fundamental point. I don't even think it's a matter. I think we should transcend this anger toward the, the Tubman movie, right? I'm going to try, at least that's my journey. I'm going to try to transcend the irritation I have with Comcast for, you know, with, with this company, whatever the studio is called, for making a bad film. Whatever the studio, the studio, is, uh, it's out of, out of Comcast. Let me see here. Um, focus features. I'm, I'm not going to be mad at focus features for doing what, what white folks do. White folks ain't never going to stop being white. And it's their right to be white. You have a right to be white. You can be whatever you want to be. And, and I bless you with the right to be who the hell you are. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bless myself. I want to bless my people and bless us with the right to be who the hell we want to be. And what I'm telling you is from a fundamental standpoint, black stories should be told by black people. And in fact, that goes back to the black core of three that we talk about in the black business school that we believe black people should educate our own children. We should create our own jobs. We should support black businesses. If we do those three things, then you can build whatever you want. You can build a Tyler Perry Studios, but you can do it better than Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry, great man. God bless him for what he's accomplished. But I believe we could build a Tyler Perry Studios type of empire without all the limitations, right? We could do it without putting on a Medea dress. Remember, Tyler Perry Studios is the house that Medea built. 80, 90% of his blockbuster films were involved him wearing a dress. I'm not going, I don't want to put on no dress. And no black man who's not gay, who doesn't want, who's not trying to be a woman, should be putting on no dress. No straight black man needs to be putting on no damn dresses. Now, if that's who you are, then I'm not gonna hate you for it. But guess what? You're gonna be in the minority. The majority of the men are not gonna be putting on no dresses. I hope that we can agree on that. It's not homophobic. It's just being realistic. It's about survival. 
you can't produce if all the men are trying to sleep with the men and ain't nobody getting together with the women. OK, so so I think that you can build something greater than Tyler Perry Studios without putting on the Medea dress and without taking money from Lionsgate. Right. We don't need a Lionsgate. We don't need a Medea dress. You can take those things out. And if you just circulate black dollars, just keep that money flowing in your community. Just, you know, supporting black businesses. You see something black and you like it, you, you, you go for the You go for it. You support it if you can. And if you got a choice between something that's black and something that's not black, if it's a black owned business, you lean toward the black owned business. Doesn't mean you got to be perfect. You, you know, some of the money is going to spill out. We're going to spend money in other communities. That's almost an inevitability for, for most of you out here. But it does mean that when given the choice, when given the opportunity, you can kind of lean black and keep some of that money in your community. And if you could just increase your black spending by maybe 10 percent. Right. Just sort of take that out of that one point three trillion. Just take another 10 percent of that one point three trillion and keep it for yourselves. That's one hundred billion dollars a year, actually one hundred twenty billion, one hundred thirty billion, excuse me, per year that is flowing and circulating in your community. That's enough to create thousands of millionaires. That's enough to create. Uh, you know, 10, 20 Tyler Perry studios. That's enough uh, for us to recirculate and turn that into hundreds of billions of dollars. That's enough for us to invest. That's enough for us to have our own school systems. That's enough for us to just do our own thing. And when you're doing your own thing, then you don't care what other people are doing. Right. You know, you, you, it just doesn't matter anymore. Right. So I want us to get to the point, not so much that we overcome the racism, but to the point where we don't even have to think about the racism because we're too busy building our own. You follow me? Do you get it? Do you get what I'm saying? Give me a yes or no to let me know that we're on the same page. Do you get what I, what what the, the point of this whole conversation? I hope that you guys get what I'm saying. I'm really trying to help you get the keys to power. You know, the keys to power. It's almost like love, right? It's almost like in a. You ever, I don't know if you've been in a bad relationship where somebody dumps you and you're hurt and you're mad and you you feel rejected and you feel alone and your self esteem's hitting you. You feel like ain't nobody gonna want you and you need that person to be in your life in order for you to feel good again and, and you love them even though they treat you like shit and everybody tells you that but you still love them anyway and you really want them back and you're crying over this person and so you become a, so what do you do? When you're overcoming it, you start fighting. You start fighting the demon. You start you start shadow boxing almost, right? You you become obsessed. You're like, what well, well, who she's with, who she's dating, you know, who she oh she oh she don't like that. Oh, it's a that's old weak ass motherfucker. That old that old lie sign me as a well that girl, that bitch, she he dating that old fat bitch, that old sloppy ass hoe. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know how you get like that where you, for a little while you're like mad at that person because they took something from you and you feel like they owe you something and you feel like you should be next to them and you need them in your life in order for you to feel, feel validated, right? But what happens when when you find new love, when you find love for yourself and you find love for somebody else, right? Like what happens when your, your self-esteem boosts up, you heal a little bit, and then you go out into the world and you find somebody better. What happens when you find somebody better? Well, then you're not thinking about that person anymore. You know, somebody comes up and says, oh, girl, did you hear that he's dating so-and-so? You're like, oh, well, that's great. Oh, no, he's not. Really? Oh, wow. I wish them the best, right? Like like you you become kind of the, the anti-Negro in a way because the negativity, negativity wants you to stay in that negative place. Negativity wants you to keep gossiping and being pissed off and mad and wishing ill on other people, wishing negative on other people. But so, but 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 when you overcome the negativity, you're just you 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 annoy people, right? Because you you're just happy for them. You're like, oh my god, wow, so oh I you see him in the mall. Hey, how are you? Oh, nice to meet you, Sarah. It's so good. Oh my gosh, well well, good luck with this one. I wish you guys the best. I'll see you soon, right? Or or you get married. Oh, can I get an invitation, right? You 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 go to a different level. Why? Well, because you found your happiness. You found a better place for yourself, right? So what I think with black people, we're in this long term abusive relationship with white supremacy. We love white supremacy to death. Uh, we, 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 for some reason, we, we feel like we need each other. Uh, we are deeply devoted to white supremacy. And we get really mad when white people reject us. We get really upset when they tell us that they don't want to let us in. We get mad when they don't want us to participate in what they got going on. We get mad when we can't sit by their side anymore because we've been doing that for 400 years, right? And, and what I find is that truly empowered black people who go and build their own, who learn self-love, who get to sort of be in a black space, they find that they're in a happier space, a healthier space, and a space that's so wonderful that they can't even remember the tragedy of having to get up every day and work with people who can't stand you, right? They don't remember that. They don't know nothing about that, you know? And so so I think that as black people, I think that we can achieve that world. I think that those of us who have that vision can go out and, and create that world. Um, so, I, so what I'm looking for is this. I'm looking for uh, the day where we create a real Harriet Tubman movie 
made by black people telling the story from a black perspective. And we get black historians to break it all down, black filmmakers to shoot it, black writers to write the screenplay and black audiences filling up entire auditoriums to see this black film because they know the story is accurate. You don't let other people tell your damn stories. That's the point. That's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm explaining to you right now. All right. So uh, I hope that we get each other. I hope we understand what's going on. Thank you guys for hanging out. Make sure you uh, subscribe to the black financial channel.com T-H-E. That's the black financial channel.com. Also, if you haven't, if you want to learn about wealth building and stuff like that, you guys know that the black business school is always sponsoring all of this stuff that we're doing. So feel free to go to the black business school.com T-H-E. That's the black business school.com. We have personal wealth specialists that can talk to you right now about your financial future and what it is you want to do. And they can kind of help you figure out what your next step might be. And, uh, and also if you go in and just get a free membership, you can actually should get invited to the lecture that I'm going to do next week. It's going to be a private lecture. I can't do this publicly, uh, but we're going to do an entire lecture. Where I'm going to break down the Byron Allen interview on the breakfast club in extreme detail and let you guys know kind of what I'm seeing here now. Um, and by the way, some of you are looking, looking for me to be on the breakfast club on the fourth. I have to tell you guys the truth. Y'all know I keep it 100. Um, I heard from Charlemagne. He said, come on the show. I hit him back. I didn't hear back. But then I heard back a few days later, no, 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 we really want you on the show. <laughs> and then I and then I hit the guy up and I didn't hear back from the guy. His name is Eddie. So he doesn't email back. So I think what probably happened is maybe some, you know, some rapper became available and whatever. But the thing is, I'm not just sitting around waiting to go on a show like that. But I just want to share that with you guys who happen to be looking for me. I did not buy my plane ticket. I'm not going to buy no ticket until I know for sure that it's going to happen. So, but it has happened four times. I've been on breakfast club four times. I've been beyond blessed by, by revolt and Diddy and, 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 um, and uh, Charlemagne. So there's no ill will toward them whatsoever. But honestly, to be real with y'all, I really don't like doing interviews that much anyway. Um, I kind of like having my own platform because I like being able to be free with you and saying what's on my mind without anybody telling me what I can and cannot say. And last thing I want to do is go on some show that's owned by white people and get some bro brother fired because I don't say something that's too radical because I think that sometimes the truth is not comfortable. The truth is not politically correct. The truth is not sanctioned by white supremacy. Uh, but I'm looking for truth because life is short. You're going to die soon. So you should spend that time seeking truth and bliss and whatever it is that matters for you. So seek meaning in your life. Don't go for the bullshit. That's my two cents, guys. Have a good day. Love you. Hit the thumbs up button before you go. Subscribe and all that stuff. I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Peace.